this morning I was just thinking what to share tonight and I feel like the Lord just dropped a word in my spirit and so I don't know how it's going to go but, but, but let's try it, you know, and let's go this direction. I got about 23 minutes and so um, I want to talk about developing a spirit of a conqueror, developing a spirit of a conqueror because God has called you and me to live in the place of victory all the time. Amen? To live in the place of victory all the time. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. We always live life from the position of victory in our life. That you and me, the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Amen? And so it doesn't matter what's happening in and around us. We live in that place because that's what God's word and God's plan for our lives outlines to us. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, and I think they might have some slides. Uh, in the Ephesians chapter number 5, uh, I, I like this word, especially in the Amplified. It says, this, it says, look carefully then how you walk. And I like each one of these words in the Amplified. It says, live purposefully, worthily, <laughs> accurately. Do, do, do those words describe your life? That you are living life with purpose. <laughs> That you're really worth your salt. That there is really an alignment to what you're doing, to what God has for your life. Or are you just surviving? <laughs> it says it's not as unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent. Come on, look at your neighbor for a moment. Say, neighbor, you are very intelligent. I know for some of you it was a faith statement. Come on, look at your other neighbor, your second choice. <laughs> Come on, look at your other neighbor. Hey, neighbor, smile. You look better that way. And so God has called us to live life purposefully, amen? Worthily, accurately. You know, but we are living in times that things have been changing. Last three years, the whole world, everything is being re 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 redefined. There is no longer what we call a landscape, something solid that we can walk on, something that we know. And so I use another word called seascape, not landscape, but seascape. And for those that are in that industry, you would know what I'm talking about. Why? Because this seascape is kind of like the boat on a ship in the water. Everything is constantly changing. Everything happens at a very fast pace. Everything, you find yourself in new places all the time. You can't really plan stuff. All you got to do is listen. There has to be security in your life that I, I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing of what God has called me to do. You have to have that confidence. I want to look at a story in the Bible. And it's a story in the book of Judges. Judges is an interesting portion of scripture because what you find in the book of Judges is there is a cycle of defeat. The children of Israel that are there, they do something wrong, they sin. And then after they sin, they pay the price for their sin. And some of them, five years, ten years, some are like good Christians, they can wait a long time and suffer a long time before they pray. Some waited 30 years and then they would cry out to God. And when they cry out to God, God would hear them. God would raise up a deliverer, answer them, and then there's a silence period. <laughs> Everything is like boring. <laughs> and so since it's boring, they sin again. Again, they pay for their sin. Again, God raises up somebody. <laughs> again, <laughs> there is silence. Again, everything seems boring. Again, they sin. It's amazing how much boredom last two years being locked up can do. It's amazing how much boredom can push you off of where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's amazing. And so in those times, this particular story is a story about a man by the name of Ehud, E-H-U-D. This man in Judges chapter number third, the three, where you find that this man, there was something unique that was marked about him, that the Bible says that he was left-handed. That was the distinct mark about this man. He was left-handed. I want to read this story very quickly to you in the book of Judges chapter number three, verse 15 onwards. It reads something like this. It says, the people of Israel cried out to God, and the God raised up for a savior, Ehud, son of Gera, 
a Benjamite. He was left-handed. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, king of Moab. Ehud made himself a short two-edged sword and strapped it on his thigh, right thigh under his clothes. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was grossly fat. I wanted to call this sermon, How Lefty Killed Hefty. Uh, but that's not my title. And, and, and Ehud finished presenting the tribute. He went to a little way with the man who carried it. But when he got as far as the stone images near Gilgal, he went back and said, I have a private message for you, O king. And the king told his servant, leave. They all left. Ehud approached him. The king was now alone in the cool rooftop. And he goes on to say that Ehud reached on his left hand, took his sword from his right thigh, plunged it into the king's big belly. Not only the blade, but the hilt went in. The fat closed in. Now you know why I chose the message Bible. <laughs> the fat closed in over it so he could, couldn't pull it out. Ehud slipped out and shut and locked the doors of the rooftop behind him. When the servants came, they saw with surprise that the doors of the rooftop room were locked. They said, he's probably relieving himself in the restroom. It's an interesting story because all throughout the book of Judges, God uses different people. And the problem with the Bible that I have is God uses people who I would have never picked. I would have never got these guys. But how many of you are glad that I'm not picking is God who's calling us. Is God who looks at something that we can't see within ourselves and prepares us for what he has for our lives. The Bible says that this man, Ehud, God raised him up for this time because of the cry of the children of Israel and raised him up as a deliverer. He was a conqueror. He was a person who God used to bring deliverance to the children of Israel. And so this morning as I was preparing this message, I just felt like I wanted to say five, six things very quickly to you regarding developing a spirit of a conqueror from the life of Ehud. Why? Because I believe there are some basic principles that you and me, we need to be reminded of as God works on our life, brings our life in accuracy to what he has for us. And so because of time, I want to go very fast. And I want to just give you five, six things very quickly regarding Ehud. Okay. What can we learn? What, can we, what is God saying to us from the life of Ehud? Number one, if you're going to develop a spirit of a conqueror, if you're going to be victorious, if you're going to be a warrior, if you're going to be a somebody that, 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 that lives in the place of victory, number one, you must develop a sense of self-worth. You must develop a sense of self-worth. The Bible says the name Ehud means my life shall glorify God. It means, hey, I shall glorify God. His name, he said, you know what, hey, my name means I shall praise God. I shall glorify God. I am going to live up to my name. I am going to live up to my name. You know, all throughout the Bible, one of the things that we find is this, that God could not use anybody unless they came to the reality of who they see themselves as in the way that God sees them as. Until that revelation came, they could not be used. Why? Because all throughout the Bible, we find people changing names. We find God changing names. For example, the woman was in pain when they delivered a child, and she named him Jabez. Why? Because she said, because I had pain, I'm going to transfer it to my child. There are a lot of people, they'll give you an identity based on their experience. Am I making sense to you? <laughs> we have Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, his name <laughs> means God <laughs> is my judge. <laughs> they, they changed his name. <laughs> Bel Sajar. It means, hey lady, talk about gender confusion. Hey lady. Protect the king. Everywhere, every day, people will do things that will change your identity. Some are like Naomi in the Bible. The Bible says her name means 
pleasant, but she made some choices. She made some choices. She was in a place called Bethlehem, Judah, and she left there, went down to Moab, and paid for the place where God had put her. She left there. Husband died, children died, and she comes back, and she gives another name to herself. She says, you know what, call me Mara, bitter. And then she blames God. <laughs> for the Lord has dealt bitterly. Why did you leave? And why are you blaming God? It's amazing how many people take on an identity, maybe based on their experiences, maybe based upon the environment that they grew up in, in their family, or even in their church, or some kind of leader that they have that treated them bad. They take that identity and become that throughout their life. All through the Bible, you have God changing names. Why? So that they could walk into their identity. Am I making sense to you? It's amazing. You know, all during COVID time, I went to the hospitals. I laid hands on COVID people. I saw COVID people get healed. I never wore a mask. And that's not to say you shouldn't wear a mask. But, but, but all throughout time, we saw Christian people scared. Why? It's just knowledge they have. Greater is it that's inside of you. It's just head knowledge. It's very quiet today. There has to be something inside of your life that you realize that you need to be awakened and come alive to who you are. And the problem with the church world, with COVID, COVID has really re <laughs> made us realize <laughs> that we have built nothing. <laughs> Listen, you are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Am I making sense to you? You are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You need to be awakened and lined up to who you are. Listen, if there's anything I want to say to you from Ehud's life, is this that number one, you must constantly work on your identity, on your self-worth, because it is going to get challenged. It is going to get challenged. And who you are is who you are in crisis. Anybody can stand up and preach. <laughs> Anybody can read a book and write nice, nice thoughts. Today's social media is full of writing two two liners. Never got anybody healed, never saved anybody, <laughs> never did anything. But they have the knowledge about God. Listen, until <laughs> you are who you are is who you are in a crisis. Am I making sense to you? That's your real identity. It should come forth. The second thing I want to say to you very quickly is this, that number two, you must get a proper perspective. You see, every time, whatever situation is, is there in our life, there is always a lens that you can look through. And many times we put on a lens that is based upon our history, based upon our past, based upon uh, what we have gone through. And, 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 and so, but it is not a lens of what God is showing you right now. And so many times God would come to people throughout the Bible and ask a stupid question. He would put something in front of their eyes. What do you see? Oh, they get scared. They get confused. Because God is actually showing them a tree. God is actually showing them an almond. God is actually showing them a boiling pot. God is actually... And then she's like, a, it's, it's the problem. It doesn't matter what I show you. The problem is your lens. Am I making sense to you? Your lens. And, and Ehud had to really see that, you know what? Hey, I can be used by God. I can be used by God. He had to put on that lens. Well, Nikki, what do you mean? Please understand, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people. They say things as a, 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 like a pinch to their guilt. For example, people, oh, we are praying for revival. We are praying for revival. I'm like, for what? The question is, what role do you see yourself playing in the revival? Can you see yourself? Well, well, I'm praying that God would answer this prayer. Listen, that's not the question. The question is, what role are you seeing in the answered prayer? Am I making sense to you? Do you, where do you see yourself in it? Can you see yourself in the answer? 
Because sometimes it's just a guilt factor. We are praying for this general, but we've got to get specific. Put on a lens and say, listen, I'm praying, I'm believing, I'm fasting, I'm wanting this breakthrough. But, but listen, this is how I see myself in that answer. Can you see that? Can you see yourself in what God is doing? There are some principles I'll, I'll put up on the screen, uh, and, and these are like life principles. I just thought of throwing it in here. Uh, uh, maybe you can write it down. If you don't have a place to write that down, after the book of Malachi, there's a blank page. <laughs> Listen, three, four simple principles to put on to build your lens. Number one, this is number one, God does everything that he does according to your potential based on a promise. That means God does everything according to your potential based on a promise. That means please understand, God is not only a promise maker, he's a promise keeper, but he's also a promise enabler. But please understand that promise is according to your potential. He'll never squeeze out of you what you don't have. Others will, but he'll not. Number two, God does everything that he does according to a plan <laughs> and based on purpose. And so to me, these two words are very scary words because half the church doesn't know what it means. So, so, so when you ask people, <laughs> hey, I am believing God for this. I want God to do this in my life. I want God to use me. I, I, my question is, why? My question is, what's the plan? And, and, and when people don't know, they have a nice word. When they're confused of what's happening, when they're confused, they don't know what's happening, they have a nice word. They say, uh, I am in transition. <laughs> what does that mean? That means, please don't ask me, I have no clue what's happening. And, and, and I say to you, listen, God does everything that he does according to a, a pattern based on a principle. That means, hey, if you want God to do something, find out, God, what is your pattern for this? And, and what is the principle? That's everything. That's relationships. That's you serving in the house of God. That's you fulfilling the call of God. That's everything. Number four, God does everything that he does according to a process and based on placement. That means, please understand, everything God does, it's a process. And can I tell you something? Those processes, only God knows. <laughs> the Bible says the children of Israel, when he took them out of Egypt, <laughs> they could reach the promised land 11 days. 11 days. 11 days where God says, I'm going to take them a route so that they can exercise faith and obedience. 40 years. <laughs> the disciples were with Jesus. <laughs> and the Bible says, Jesus constrained the disciples and God, get in the boat. He constrained them. That means he made them get in the boat. <laughs> and then he goes up to the top of the mountain and he prays. Why? Because please understand, that was not the only way to get on the other side. <laughs> they could have walked, and in six, seven hours, they could have reached the other side. That was not the only way. But there was a purpose. He put them on the boat. <laughs> he goes up to pray, and he says, hopefully these, I mean, hopefully these disciples, they understand how to respond. Why? He showed them something before. Before there was a storm. He was sleeping. <laughs> he got up and he rebuked the storm. And this time he said, there's a better way, but please understand, I'm taking them purposely through this way. Why? <laughs> because they need to understand it's a process. In process, I am training. Because based on that process and based on their response to the training, I'm going to place them in a place of fulfillment. A lot of people have great calling, great vision, great dream. There are more prophecies than there are pages in the Bible. And they wonder, well, why isn't anything happening? Because you're not following the process. And you're not realizing that the process is what decides 
the placement. Am I making sense to you? Put on a, a new lens. Number three, very quickly, I want to say this to you. Quit running from risks. <laughs> Quit running from risk. The Bible says Ehud, he got with the people that he came with, he got the tribute, he went and gave it to the king. And at that time he could have said, I have a word, but he ran away. <laughs> and the Bible says in verse 18 and 19, it says he, he walked away and then he turned back. <laughs> then he turned back. Listen, I want to say to you, quit running from risks. Many, many times I realize this in my own life and, and I realize this working with a lot of people is this that there are a few things that affect us from not obeying God. Number one, sometimes is the crowd that we are around. They talk you out of the things of God or they put you in things. But, but more commonly, uh, a lot of people walk away because what I say is something like this, their emotional fuel is low. They have never taken time to recharge themselves. They're going, 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 but they've never recharged. And, and when your emotional fuel is low, how does that become? When you're handling pressure. For Elijah, a simple letter came to him and he lost it. <laughs> he began on the run. <laughs> and can I tell you something? When your emotional fuel is low, number one, fear creeps into your life. Number two, I find myself running away from things. Number three, I start backing out of my commitments in relationships. Number four, I make foolish decisions impulsively. Why? Because my emotional fuel is low. Number five, I push myself past my physical limits. Number six, my work seems pointless. I complain that I want to quit and give up. I, I feel isolated and attacked. I compare myself to others and feel bad about me. I think death might bring relief. It's amazing, Moses prayed, Elijah prayed, how many people prayed? <laughs> Lord, just kill me, just kill me. Why? Because their emotional fuel is low. And I want to say to you today, listen, quit running from risk. Yes, there is pressure. And yes, there are people who will challenge you. But listen, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes, there are circumstances that become overwhelming. But listen, that's why you are a believer. That's why you are different from the world. That's why your response is different from the world's response. Why? Because you got the word of God. Why? Because you got the Holy Spirit. Why? You got the covenant of God. You got the blood of Jesus. You got the name of Jesus. I mean, you got so many tools. Quit running from risk. Let me just do one more thing and I'll kind of close with this. Is this that number, number four, you must reprogram your mind. You must reprogram your mind. You must reprogram your mind. What does that mean? That means, hey, <laughs> what are the systems that are operating inside of me? And where is the source of those systems? Because a lot of time we respond to things based upon what we hear happen to others. We hear, you know, you know sometimes some people, you just hear their story. Just you, nothing's happening to you. You hear their story and you take two Panadol. <laughs> Why, because it's overwhelming. Am I making sense to you? It's overwhelming. And, and I wanna say, you must reprogram your mind. You must realize that, hey, listen, doesn't matter what's happening around. Doesn't matter who's saying what. Doesn't matter, everything seems like a failure. It's going from bad to worse. But the scripture says I'm going from faith to faith, glory to glory. But the scripture says that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Am I making sense to you? And it's not a one-time thing. Please understand, it's a daily thing. 
Paul said something like this, listen, our outward man is perishing day by day, but our inward man, our inward man is getting renewed. How? Daily. How? He said, because I have the spirit of faith. I believe, therefore I speak. And so, guess what? Who you are is the words that are coming out of your mouth in the midst of crisis. Am I making sense to you? In the midst of crisis. I want to say to you today as I bring it to close, number five is stay in the area of your strength. Ehud, <laughs> at that time, nobody checked him. Why? Because everybody that's a warrior is usually a right-handed man. And so nobody checked him. It was looked at as a handicap. Can I tell you something? God can take your handicaps and do something that is completely extraordinary through your life. Am I making sense to you? Completely extraordinary. It's something that is created just for you. I want to say to you, listen, stay in the area of your strength. What does that mean? That simply means this, that God can take your handicap. God can take your handicap. God can take what others think is a handicap, that others think is not there, and turn it completely around and make it a useful thing for your life. Am I making sense to you? He can do it. And so today, I want to just challenge you. Listen, you are called to live in the place of victory. Look like it. Speak like it. Live like it. It doesn't happen just because you come to the altar, somebody lays hand and you fall down and you get up. It happens daily, de making decisions that are in the scripture and say, God, I know this is what you're saying. I know this is what's, what's, what's happening. I know this is where I am. Help me to line up. The Bible says in Ephesians, it says, listen, be careful how you walk. Live purposefully, live accurately, and live worthily. Am I making sense to you? Would you close your eyes for a moment? Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. And today, Lord, what I cannot do, that you do by your Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen, that you would encourage, that you would lift up every head in this place. Every sense of discouragement, every sense of depression, every sense of hopelessness. That you would lift it up, I pray, God. Because you are the lifter of our head. And today I pray that every person walk out of this place with their head lifted high. Because they are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. No sickness, no disease, no virus, no economic situation. Nothing can come nigh what the word of God says in who we are. We bless you. 